Today is the SAT Writing and Language Workshop that I am offering in partnership with the Safety Harbor Public Library here in Tampa Bay, Florida. If this is your first time joining one of these workshops, hi, my name is Carla Berry, and I have been offering SAT and ACT prep to students for over 10 years. And today we're going to dive really deeply into the writing and language section specifically. So we have an hour together today and I want to spend most of that hour actually answering real SAT questions. We are going to be using practice test 10 from the College Board. If you are preparing for the SAT on your own, I highly recommend first working through real practice tests directly from the College Board or from Khan Academy before you start using practice tests from third party sources. So I am going to end the poll here and then I'll share the results so you can all see the results too as I go through them here. So when are you taking the SAT? There's quite a few of you taking the SAT this November and then some taking the SAT in December or beyond. What grade are you in? We have quite a few 12th graders today. Hi seniors. It's a big deal, right, to get your SAT score up by the end of the year for college applications. However, if you are applying for Bright Futures and Bright Futures is your primary goal for the SAT, please remember that you have until the summer after you graduate from high school to get the SAT score that you need to qualify for Bright Futures. And then I see that we have some ninth and 11th graders, year two and a middle schooler getting an early start. Um, it's never too early to start preparing for the SAT. Have you taken the SAT before? I have almost a 50-50 split. Most of you have not though. So it will be your first time taking the test. The best experience that you could give yourself before you take the test for real on test day is to work through practice tests from the College Board. And then question number four here, which grammar concepts do you find the most difficult? Um, so there, let's see which ones were the most popular. So semicolons, um, I'd say for sure dashes, parallel structure, and who versus whom definitely stand out here. And we will be looking at some of those today as we answer real questions. Do you know what a dangling or a misplaced modifier is? Most of you do not. I'm sure we will see at least one today. And then do you know how to approach a meaning versus grammar question? That's going to be one of the main things that we look at today, because just knowing how to approach a question is critical to answering that question correctly. Do you have to read, skim the entire passage in the writing and language section? So most of you said no, and the answer is actually yes, you do. So even if a part is not underlined, you still have to read or skim all of the parts, even the parts that are not underlined. Otherwise, you won't be able to answer those meaning questions. So in order to score really high in the writing and language section, you cannot simply skip from one underlined portion to the next underlined portion. You have to absolutely look at everything. Number eight, are the questions arranged in order of difficulty in the writing and language section? They are not. They are all mixed in together. So you could have a hard question first or an easy question first. They are given to you in no particular order. So you have to be really aware of what kind of question you are answering and if it would be in your best interest to save that question for last. And as we look at some real writing and language passages today, I'm going to help you to identify question types that I would personally save for the very end and I wouldn't necessarily answer right when I come across that question. And then is this the first workshop that you are taking with me? And most of you said no, so great to see you again or for you to see me again since <laughs> I can't see you. Um, so let's get started here. So I actually just wanna take a quick look at the resources that I gave to you in the email just so that you are familiar so let me pull that up because really understanding these resources will be critical for you preparing 
for the writing and language section. So just so that you know, in my opinion, the writing and language section is by far the easiest section on the SAT to increase your score. So I have seen students for over a decade increase their writing and language score substantially with fairly minimal effort compared to the effort required for other sections. So to increase your math score on the SAT, you have to put in hours and hours and hours and weeks and months of work to really see a really good increase in the math sections. For the reading section, you also have to put in quite a bit of time and energy. For the writing and language section, however, if you really buckle down and you spend just a couple of hours studying the grammar rules and understanding them, and then taking some practice sections and applying those rules, making sure to review your answers after you are done taking the practice section and correcting your mistakes and then referencing those grammar rules again to see what you need to memorize a little bit more or understand a little bit better, you're going to see big score gains in this section. So in the email that I sent everyone and that I have linked in the chat box, I have a couple of resources. So the first resource here, and you've you have had a workshop with me in the past. It will be very familiar to you is the core concepts and critical thinking skills handout. And in this handout, I have some writing and language strategies on the second page. And this is just a brief overview of things to watch out for in the writing and language section. Most of this is also going to be found in the larger grammar handout that we're going to look at next, except for this very first thing here in the upper left corner, beware. So I want you to beware of any answers that contain words that end in ing, contain the word being, contain the word it, contain the word was, and then also long answer choices. I want you to be really careful of those um, as you are answering questions. It doesn't mean that a long answer choice will never be correct or that you will never pick an answer that contains the word being in it or contains the word it. It just means that we're going to be really wary of them. So if we have an alternative option that we could pick instead, um, we should do so. So whenever you pick an answer choice that has one of these issues, I want you to be ready with your defense of why you had to, why nothing else could work as well. OK, let's see here. Let's go back to your resources. So we also have um, the grammar handout in here, and I'm just going to open that up for everyone. So the grammar handout is not something that I've created. It's actually from thecriticalreader.com. And the grammar handout really goes over all of the grammar rules that you need to know really, really well for the SAT. And if you are also taking the ACT, you are in luck because these grammar rules are the exact same for both tests. So if you are preparing for the ACT also, and you are looking at the math section, there's going to be different things that you need to know for ACT math versus SAT math. But for the writing and language section of the SAT and the English section of the ACT, even though the questions can sometimes be a little bit different, the concepts that you need to know are the exact same. So your starting point, and we're not going to go through this entire handout together today because I want time for us to actually look at questions and apply these concepts. But throughout this next week, or as soon as you have some free time, I want you to sit down for an hour or two, pour yourself a cup of coffee or a nice glass of water, and just sit down with a highlighter or a pen and this handout. It's only 14 pages long, and that may seem long, but I think there's a lot of white space on here. It's not that much reading. And I want you to go through each concept and look at what the rule is and look at the examples and make sure that you really 
understand them. If you come across something that you don't understand that well, make sure that you star it or highlight it or sticky note it so that you know that you need to come back to those concepts and review them later on. And then this should become one of your best friends throughout your SAT prep journey. Keep on referring back to it whenever you miss questions on the writing and language section and add extra stars and extra exclamation points if it's something that you struggle with. Okay, let's go back to our resources in here. I have also included a blank copy of practice test 10, a scoring guide for practice test 10, if you just want to check your answers. And that's for the whole test, not just for the writing and language section. And then also my solutions are linked down here. And then finally, the last thing that I included is the writing and language core concepts. And let's just take a quick look at this. So this is a one pager and we may refer to it somewhat today, just a little bit, um, but this becomes more meaningful to you once you have gone through that entire grammar handout. Remember that 14 page one that I showed previously and you've really started studying. And what I've included in here are not just the triggers and the rules that you need to be able to identify. I've also included little tips for how to quickly get to the right answer for some of these question types. So we may um, reference this throughout today's session as appropriate. Okay, does anyone have any questions before we get started today? If we don't have any questions, we're going to dive on in and start with the writing and language section of practice test 10. Okay, I'm going to just pull this up here. And oops, where did we go? Here we go. Share that in there. Okay, so the writing and language section is 35 minutes for 44 questions. When you're first starting to take practice tests and you don't have that much experience behind you, it may be difficult for you to answer all 44 questions in 35 minutes. That is okay. But as you become an expert in this section, and as you really learn all of those grammar rules and come to understand how to approach these passages, you should really start having time remaining at the end of the section. So it is not unusual for a student who is prepared and who has mastered the section to have five or 10 minutes left at the end of the section to go back and check his or her work. So that's a good goal for you to aim for and to see if you are on the right track. Because you know what happens as you answer more of these questions and you become more familiar with the grammar rules, you should be able to really quickly identify what the problem is and be able to fix it. It should not, for the most part, to be an extensive scavenger hunt to try to figure out what's going on. The SAT is extremely predictable, especially in the writing and language section. So they are not reinventing the wheel or trying to trick you or create um, new grammar rules or strategies on each practice test. They are just simply checking to see if you know the core grammar concepts. Okay, so writing and language test, 35 minutes, 44 questions. My goal for today is to get through at least the first two passages. I think that would be a good goal. And there goes my pen. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so to begin with, you can read the directions on your own at some point. You should not be needing to read the directions on test day. <laughs> you should already know them pretty well. It's not something you're going to spend your time on. It's going to look the exact same on test day as what it looks on your practice test. So there's no reason for you to read that again. And then when we go to our passage, we're going to want to read the title and also 
kind of remember the title. So don't ever forget what the title is. And remember that you can come back to the title. Can anyone tell me in the chat why the title could be important to us and why we don't just want to skip over the title? Anyone have any idea? While I wait to see if you have um, some ideas about why the title may be useful, I want to introduce a little concept to you that on the writing and language section, we are going to be looking for grammar questions and meaning questions. And for each question we want to identify, is this a grammar question or is this a meaning question? Because if it's a grammar question, it's going to be pretty straightforward. All of the answer choices will pretty much have the same words for the most part. Maybe there will be one or two words different in each answer choice, but for the most part, they're going to look the same. And maybe they'll all even have the exact same words, but each answer choice will have different punctuation and I would put that in the grammar bucket but they also have meaning questions on the SAT and meaning questions can be a lot more challenging it's for those meaning questions that we need to understand the context so that is why it is important to read parts that are not underlined and that appear to not have any questions on it because if we don't read and understand those parts we're not going to be able to answer meaning questions because we're not going to really know what the main idea of the passage is. So we'll be identifying both question types during today's session. For meaning questions, quick ways to kind of clue you in on this could be a meaning question is if a question asks you to pick a new transition to start off a sentence, if a question asks you to add information, remove information or delete a sentence, or to move a sentence from one spot to a new spot. So those are all clues that it could be a meaning question and we should pause and really look at the context and really look at what the main idea is. What is the author trying to communicate? And Catherine says that the main idea can give us a quick idea about what the, or the title can give us a quick idea um, what the passage is about. And Emmanuel says it gives us an idea what the text is about. And both those are true. So if I ever come across a meaning question and I am halfway through the passage or I'm towards the end and I'm still not really sure what the main idea is and I'm a little bit stuck with one of those meaning question types, I always refer back to the title and pick an answer choice that fits most with whatever wording was in the title. That's kind of my fallback plan. So that's why I said it's so important to not forget that they're giving us a title. Okay, so let's look at this passage and we're going to read this passage as we answer the questions, but remember in testing, even though I want you to look at parts that are not underlined, it's not necessarily not necessary for you to read those parts as in depth as we are today. It's okay to skim through those parts, kind of speed read them. But for the sake of today's session, we're just going to be reading everything. So for passage one here, it says questions one through 11 are based on this passage. And this passage's title is How a Cat in a Hat Changed Children's Education. So in a 1954 Life Magazine article, author John Hershey expressed concern that children in the United States were disengaged from learning how to read. Among other problems, Hersey noticed, noted the reading material available to grade schoolers had a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media for children's attention. So we have items in a series here, right? And we have a comma, a comma, and a, and, a comma and, and that is okay. There is nothing wrong with the sentence. If we look at our answer choices, we see one of them, D, is really long, right? And it has that ing, so there is no way I am going to pick something that is long and has an ing in the sentence 
over something that is short, sweet, and works, is not obviously violating any grammar rules. If we look at and also, well, we're already saying and, so it's not necessary to say also, also, basically. So we can take C out and then and with. We do not need that with here. So I want everyone to keep a phrase in mind as you look at every single writing and language section. And this phrase basically encompasses the goal of the writing and language section. They want you to pick answers that are clear, concise, and consistent with the rest of the passage. So clear, concise, and consistent. So if I have items in a series here, right, I do not want to change my structure for any of those items. So I can just have and. I want a concise answer choice. That's why the shortest answer choice when you're in doubt is usually the right one. Because by picking the shortest answer choice, we are avoiding redundancy issues. Did anyone notice that there was a with right here? That it says competing with television radio? We do not need to restate this with, or whoops, let me get that away, or that with. That would make it redundant. We don't need to say that with again. Um, and we want the answer that is clear and concise. So we're just gonna go with A, no change. But if you have that phrase in mind of, I'm looking for answers that are clear, concise, and consistent with the rest of the passage, you will often find yourself picking the right answer and avoiding traps without even realizing that you just avoided one. So if we're already just looking for something that's clear and concise, we would go with A, which is no change, without needing to recognize that the with would make it redundant, right? Let's go on to number two, but remember we have to read before it too. One solution he proposed was to make children's books more interesting since an individual's sense of wholeness follows and cannot provide a sense of accomplishment. So number two here says, the writer wants to include a quotation by Hersey that supports the topic of the passage, which choice um, best accomplishes this goal. Hmm, what is the topic of this passage? Let's go up to the top. So how a cat in a hat changed children's education, right? And he wanted to make these books more interesting. People, little children, not little people, little children were disengaged from reading, right? But number two is a meaning question. And here's the deal with meaning questions. Often they give us meaning questions before we are qualified to answer them. So they ask here, um, it supports the topic of the passage. I haven't read the whole passage yet. I have barely finished reading the first paragraph. I'm not 100% sure yet what the topic of the passage is. So how on earth can I expect myself to pick an answer here? I can attempt to pick an answer, but I would kind of be guessing because I haven't read everything yet. So I like to save meaning questions for the very end of the passage. And that's what we're gonna do today. So we're gonna circle to, and we're gonna come back to it after we have answered the other grammar questions that we can just look at the one little part, read the rest of the passage, and then we're gonna have so much better of an idea of what's going on here. And when we come back to number two at the very end, we should be able to answer it much more quickly, much more effectively, than if I looked at those answer choices and I attempted to evaluate them right now. Okay, so we're gonna skip over it. We're not even gonna look at what our answers options are. So for number three here, the story of the Cat in the Hat's publication began when William Spaulding, the director of the education 
division at the publishing company, Houghton Mifflin, read Hersey's article and had an idea. So this is a grammar question. This is not a meaning question. We can see that it's a grammar question because all of those answer choices have the same words in them. Um, they just have different punctuation, right? So we don't have to understand the context in order to pick the right answer here. And this is actually a modifier issue or non-issue, so to speak. So whenever you have a comma, like so, and then you have something underlined after the comma, and this is a clue that I mention in the writing and language core concepts under modifiers, you'll see here clue, words, comma, followed by comma plus words. So when we have words and then a comma and then something underlined, we want to think about, is there a modifier issue? So let's go back here. And we can see Spalding is the director, right? That makes sense. So we do not have a modifier issue here. Let's look a little bit more because we can see we have different options for punctuation. We could add a comma here, we could add a dash here, or we could just remove that comma completely in B. So we need to decide, do we need to um, do any of those? So here we have a comma two, and let's see if we can read the sentence with what without what's between the commas. So I'm just going to cross that out. So we're going to read it without what's between the commas, because if we have a pair of commas, what's between those commas would be non-essential. So the story of the Cat in the Hats publication began when William Spaulding read Hersey's article and had an idea. That sentence sounds great. It's grammatically perfect. So we need both commas. We need this first comma with the second comma. Commas come in pairs when they're non-essential. We do not by on, <laughs> we never, let me put it this way. I rarely say never, but we never want a dash comma or a comma dash to make something non-essential. So in this case, we want a comma and then another comma. We cannot put this dash here and then follow that with a comma. That would be incorrect. We can also not just remove this first comma because then we would no longer have that non-essential phrase. And then if we look at C um, and we just make the director non-essential, we would read this sentence. Let's see what that would look like for C. The story of the Cat in the Hats publication began when William Spaulding of the education division at the Houghton Mifflin Company, at the publishing company Houghton Mifflin. Well, that's kind of awkward, right? To just have the director be non essential. So we would not pick C either. So here we would have to pick A, no change. And if at any point anyone has a question over something, a concept that I'm covering, please just add it in the chat. If I don't see any questions, I'm going to assume that you understand what I am explaining. Okay, let's look at number four. So Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers. He thought he knew who should write one. He arranged to have dinner with Theodore Geisel, who wrote and illustrated children's books under the name Dr. Seuss and issued him a challenge. Write me a story that first graders can't put down. Okay, let's see what is going on here. So they want an answer choice that effectively combines the sentences at the underlying portion. So keeping it the way that it is right now is not an option. So if we have a period, what can we replace a period by? A period is equal to a semicolon and it's equal to a comma and those are all things I can replace a period by. Note that when I replace a period with a semicolon, I don't need an and. 
if I replace a period with a comma, I need the comma and. So my comma and over here is great. That is sufficient to replace a period. When I look at C and we see that semicolon and, I don't need the semicolon, I don't need the and with the semicolon. Also, C would be redundant because C has spalding here and spalding would already be mentioned in that sentence. So we would not pick C. Um, A looks great right off the bat. It's concise, right? It's short. Um, it's clear who they're talking about and it's consistent with the rest of the passage. If we look at D, and it says, and meanwhile, well, now we are changing the meaning, right? We're introducing this contrast word. We don't wanna change the meaning. We simply wanna combine the two sentences. So we would take D out and then B, remember how we're careful of dashes <laughs> with commas? Look at what happens with B. Spalding agreed that there was a need for appealing books for beginning readers, dash, <laughs> namely, he knew who should write one. Hmm. We cannot use a dash to replace a period. Um, we cannot use a dash to separate two independent clauses here. So we remember have to pick between a period, a comma, and, and that semicolon. Those are our three options. So we're going to just go with A for number four. Okay, let's look at number five. Which choice best supports information that follows in the sentence? Hmm, they want us to change the information here. So all of those answer choices are different <laughs> from each other. So this is a meaning question which means that we need to know the context, which means that we're gonna skip it and first finish the other grammar questions and then come back to this one. Um, Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator. However, this new project presented him with an obstacle. So six is also a meaning question. For questions that deal with transitions, students often get these wrong. They're frequently missed. Um, you could save it for the end of the passage. I don't think it's always necessary for picking the right transition, even though it is a meaning question. I think you can answer it if you feel comfortable when you come across the question, but I would still star it as a question that you should double check if you have time left at the end of the test. So after you are done answering all the questions, for all the passages, I would want you to come back to number six and then just double check that you checked the right, that you picked the right answer. So for questions like six, I like crossing out the transition that's here and just writing that next to no change so that I can compare those side by side. And then I read the sentence before and the sentence after, and I see how are those sentences related? Are they continuing an idea? Are they contrasting? Are they providing an example? Um, what is, how are those pieces of information related to each other? And once I determine the context and the relationship, I pick a word that best fits with that. <laughs> so having blah, 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 blank, we don't know yet what we're gonna put here, Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator. That Geisel was an experienced writer and illustrator, we are not changing, right? That's just going to stay there. So we want something that's going to connect that to this next part. This new project presented him with an obstacle. Hmm, that seems like a bit of a contrast to me because they're saying he was experienced but this was an obstacle, this new project. So we want to contrast and then we can evaluate those answer choices. So however works, that is a contrast. 
B, for example, they are not giving an example of how he's experienced in this new sentence, so it can't be that. Furthermore, it doesn't show a contrast, and at any rate, also doesn't show a contrast. For So for six, it has to be A, no change. <laughs> so if you did not feel comfortable answering this yet, you could also come back to number six since it is a meaning question that requires that you have a little bit more of an understanding of what's going on in the passage. So Spalding told Geisel to write his entire book using a restricted vocabulary from an elementary school list of 348 words Geisel started two stories only to abandon them when he found that he needed to use words that were not on the list. On the verge of giving up, hmm, we have a modifier issue right here, right? We have a comma and then something that's underlined. And I don't even need to read that entire underlined portion here in order to pick the right answer because on the verge of giving up, that needs to be a person that's on the verge of giving up. A story cannot give up. So here they're talking about Geisel's story. Can the story give up? No, it cannot. So we know it cannot be no change. We want a person's name right after that comma, preferably Geisel. If we look at the answer choices, we can see B, an image. It's not an image that's giving up. And D, a story, we've already determined that it's not a story giving up. So it cannot be B or D. And then C has Geisel giving up. And that makes sense. A person is capable of giving up. So for seven, it has to be C. The SAT loves modifier questions like number seven. And if you are really comfortable identifying those questions, you can answer them like we just did without even having to read all of the answer choices and the entire underlying portion. So I hope for everyone, a little light bulb is going off right now. Oh, this is how you're able to get through this writing and language section so quickly and possibly have five or 10 minutes left at the end of the section to check your work. Because the more you answer these questions and you become really familiar with these concepts, you'll be able to identify them really quickly and pick an accurate answer right off the bat without doing a ton of work. Okay. His main character established, Geisel commenced the difficult task of writing a book with a limited vocabulary. At the end of the duration, nine months long, who here I can also kind of see what the problem is before I even look at the answer choices. This is not concise. This is pretty redundant. We don't have to say that nine months is a duration. <laughs> we don't have to say that. Um, we know nine months is some kind of time reference. So saying at the end of the duration, nine months long, it may sound fancy. It may sound like an intellectual or smart answer choice to you, um, but that is not what the SAT rewards. We want answer choices that are clear and concise, and we cannot be concise when we're being repetitive and we're using words that are not necessary in order to communicate whatever idea we're trying to communicate. So here, as we look at the answer choices, we can see B and C are quite lengthy too. These are long answer choices. D is short. It's concise. So let's trade that one first. Nine months later, the cat in the hat was complete. That works. That has no grammatical issues with it. So we can just pick D. Let's look at number nine. The book was a hit. Children were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat and is captivated Ooh, is captivated. Remember, we want what is underlined to match what is not underlined. So let's put this here. Make what is underlined match what is not underlined. Oops, 
there we go. <laughs> so children were entertained. They were entertained and captivated. We do not need that is there before captivated. Children are plural. So they were entertained. They were captivated. Were captivated is not an option. And it would also be a little redundant. We wouldn't have to say were again. But we are making what is underlined match what is not underlined. We are not switching from plural to singular or changing our tense. Um, so we can eliminate A, B, and C and just delete that part and read the sentence without that is. So children were entertained by its plot about the antics of a mischievous cat and captivated by its eye-catching illustrations and memorable rhythms and rhymes. So note here, when I saw that a verb was underlined helping verb there is, I immediately went and located my other verb in the sentence to make sure that I was matching what was underlined to what was not underlined. I am not just grasping at air trying to decide um, what kind of verb to pick. I'm always looking at what else is in that passage? And that's why it's so important to be reading everything or at least skimming everything and not just jump from question nine to question 10 to question 11 and not, la not looking at the parts that's in between. So its sales inspired another publishing company, Random House, to establish a series for early readers called Beginner Books, which featured works by Geisel and other writers and publishers quickly followed suit. In the years that followed, many talented writers and illustrators of children's books imitated Geisel's formula of restricted vocabulary and whimsical artwork. Um, and they want to see here, should we combine those sentences? Well, we probably should, because in the years that followed as a fragment, we do not even have a verb there. I'm not even sure if we have a subject, so it cannot be no change. That's a fragment. And if the period makes it a fragment, remember the period is basically the same as a semicolon or as a comma and. So we cannot use the semicolon there either if the period doesn't work. And then let's look at that dash. We would not use a dash there either. Instead, in the years that followed, it just introduces the many talented writers and illustrators. And that makes the most sense here for number 10. Let's look at 11. And 11 is actually the last question for this passage. And it's also a meaning question. Because this question is a meaning question, if it came earlier, we would have been tempted to skip it, right, and come back to it at the end. But we're already at the end, so we're just going to answer it. Um, so, but perhaps the best proof of the cat in the hat success is not its influence on other books, but its limited vocabulary and appealing word choices. The writer wants a conclusion that restates the main themes of the passage. Um, which choice best accomplishes this goal? Well, let's go look at our title. I'm just gonna go grab that title how a cat and a hat changed children's education. And remember the problem was that children were disengaged from reading. They didn't like reading. So that was in the very first paragraph. And we can, whoops, actually just put here beneath it before we even look at the answer choices, the problem was that children were disengaged from reading. And by doing this work up front, we're actually saving ourselves a ton of work when we're evaluating those answer choices. So let's see which answer choice best ties in to our title, um, how a cat in a hat changed children's education, and that problem that they presented to us at the very beginning. Remember, we want to kind of have a nice circle for our story. So it all comes full circle. Um, the problem that children were disengaged from reading. So the writer wants a conclusion that restates the main themes of the passage. 
was the main theme, limited vocabulary and appealing word choices? Not really, right? Because they also had illustrations in the cat in the hat. So just seeing that the vocabulary was limited and they had appealing word choices doesn't totally show us how they fix the problem that the children were disengaged. So I would take out no change. B, impressive worldwide sales. This passage was not really concerned with how much money these authors made. So B would be out. C, endearing ability to delight children and engage. Hmm, those illustrations did engage them, right? And we know that it changed children's education. So endearing ability, I would say that is a permanent change to children's education. So I like C, but for meaning questions, we cannot simply pick an answer. Once we found one that works, we have to read all of the answer choices and pick the best one. So we have to read D also. Important role in the history of illustration. So illustration, neglects to mention that they also had those appealing word choices. So D would be incomplete to wrap up this passage. So D would be out and we would have to pick C for number 11. And now we're gonna quickly go back to the questions that we skipped earlier. Remember, we skipped number two here. The writer wants to include a quotation by Hersey that supports the topic of the passage, which choice best accomplishes this goal. Um, so remember the passage was about how they wrote with limited vocabulary and had these really captivating illustrations. So we want an answer choice that will include those two ideas. So no change would be interesting since an individual sense of wholeness follows and cannot proceed a sense of accomplishment. I don't even really know what that means. I'd have to read it several times to fully understand what they're saying there, which is a big red flag that that is not the right answer choice. Because remember, we want answers that are clear, concise, and consistent with the rest of the passage. So if it's not immediately clear what you're reading and you have to reread it several times to understand it, probably not going to be the right one. So we can take out A. B, interesting, since learning starts with failure, the first failure is the beginning of education. Whoa, this is really negative for this passage. I'm going to take out B. C, interesting because journalism, this passage is not about journalism um, or fiction. It's just about the cat in the hat, right? Changing children's education with limited vocabulary and really awesome pictures that interest children. And then D, interesting with drawings like those of the wonderfully imaginative geniuses among children's illustrators. And that works. That ties in to that main idea of the passage that they used um, illustrations to get the children's attention. So you will note as I evaluated these answer choices, I crossed out parts of the answer choices that made them wrong or made me want to eliminate them. And I do that in both the writing and language section and the reading section, because every now and then I eliminate every single answer choice. It happens. <laughs> I find issues with each one. And then instead of having to start from scratch, evaluating those answer choices, I can clearly see why I tossed out certain answer choices and see, well, which one's the best out of these? Which one um, is the least egregious? And go with that. Okay, let's go onwards to number five. Which choice best supports the information that follows in the sentence. So later in the sentence, we talk about him being an experienced writer and illustrator. So we want something that will give evidence for Geisel having experience. So having known Spalding for many years says nothing about his experience as a writer and illustrator. So it can't be no change. B, acquired a reputation for perfectionism. That doesn't say anything about experience. You can have, be a perfectionist, 
and have high standards and have no experience. So B is out. C, been interested in politics before breaking into the genre of children's literature. Polit like a political background says nothing about his experience as a writer and illustrator. So C is out. D, published nine children's books. Ooh, that gives evidence for experience as a writer and having received three nominations for the prestigious Caldecott Medal. Mm, I could assume that the Caldecott Medal might be something with illustrations. Um, so I'm gonna go with D, even though I have no idea what the Caldecott Medal is for. I feel comfortable with the fact that A, B, and C just does not give strong evidence for um, him having that experience as a writer and illustrator. So it has to be D. And then let's see, and we answered all of these. So let's just do a couple from the next passage. We may not have time to get through the entire passage, but that's okay. So we'll move on here. So this is a whole new passage. So it's gonna have a new main idea um, and we can leave the other passage in the past. If you do have a question in a passage that you get stuck on, um, make sure that you skip it and just come back to it at the end of the test. You are picking up points when you are taking the SAT, so it is not worthwhile to spend five minutes on one question. And I actually wanted to just see, take a quick look at the poll results here. I did see quite a few of you did not know who versus whom. And let's actually cover that real quickly before we go into a new passage. I do want to cover who versus whom. Um, where are we in here? Just got to find it inside. Here we go. OK, who versus whom? So I have a rule for how I pick between who versus whom. So who is usually going to be plus a verb, and this is just in the grammar handout where I'm writing right now. Who is plus a verb, and whom is usually going to be with a preposition. If you don't know what prepositions are, I would Google them, get a list of them and start memorizing because they are really important for the writing and language section. So common prepositions would be of, about, between, in, from. Um, those are all common prepositions. So if I see a preposition and then I have to pick between who or whom, I'm going to pick whom. If I see I need to pick between who and whom, and who is doing something. So it's going to be who plus a verb. I'm going to pick who. Um, so here, for instance, in this sentence, we can see Frida Kahlo was an artist who gained renown. Well, she did something. She gained renown. So there's a verb there. So we want who. If we look at whom there, it would be wrong because we have that verb. Um, think about if I baked brownies today and someone asked me, for whom did you bake the brownies? <laughs> well, it's me that did the baking, right? That baked those brownies. Whom will be receiving them later on in a different sentence? Not in this sentence, not yet. We have that for right before the whom, so it would be for whom. One other thing I want you to look at with, um, before I let you go today, is for subject verb agreement and just knowing um, your prepositions. So prepositional phrases do not impact subject verb agreement. So whenever we are picking the right verb for the subject. We want to be really careful that we are um, eliminating our prepositional phrase first. So if we look here at this sentence, illegal logging in Mexican forests have resulted. 
Well, in Mexican forest is a prepositional phrase. So we can just cross that out. It's not going to impact which verb we pick. So it's logging that has resulted. Logging is singular. So we need a verb that is singular. So illegal logging has resulted in the destruction of the monarch butterfly's habitat. You sometimes may also see a subject separated from the verb by a really long non-essential phrase, in which case you also want to cross that out when you're picking the verb. Look at this comma right here, and then there's another comma right there. So we can cross out that part between the commas when we are picking our verb. So we can say the cochineal were commonly used as a colorant in painting. That's one thing, this is singular, this is the insect. So it should be the insect was commonly used as a colorant in painting, not were. So always be on the lookout for non-essential phrases and also prepositional phrases with subject verb agreement. Does anyone have questions before we wrap up today? I think it would actually be best if we don't dive into a whole new passage since we just have one minute remaining. Um, somebody asked, do, you, do I think it's worth it to purchase the SAT answer key after you take the test? So for March, May, and October of every year, the SAT offers the QAS, the question and answer service, which enables you to see both the questions and your answers. I 100% think it's worth it to purchase that QAS if they have it available for your test day, because then you can see the questions that you miss specifically and learn from that for next time. So I would totally say it's worth it to get the QAS. For those of you still with me, I'm going to reshare the evaluation link. And as always, if even if you have filled this out in the past, I would appreciate it if you filled it out again. Um, and just give me feedback on today's workshop. Let me know if you feel more comfortable with the writing and language section after today. And if you learned anything, and that way I can use that information for planning future workshops. I am going to hang out with you here for one more minute, see if anyone else has any questions. I did see in the beginning that I have quite a few seniors with me here today. If you are taking the SAT in November, I would, and you need a substantial SAT score increase, I would plan on signing up for December also because the SAT won't be offered again until March. So you wanna make sure that you have that testing opportunity in December and that it doesn't fill up and you are left without a spot. Um, if you are a senior also and you are taking both November and December SATs, I wouldn't wait until you get your November score back to start studying for the December SAT. If you do get your November score back and you are done with the SAT, you don't ever have to take it again, that's great way to go. If you get it back and you do have to take it again, then you had been studying during that waiting period and you're going to be so much better prepared for the December SAT than if you just took a break until you got your score back. Okay, so I don't see any other questions here today. I am still in the process of planning more of these workshops for the rest of the school year, so be on the lookout for those from the Safety Harbor Public Library. I hope to see you guys back here next time. Thanks and have a great evening. Bye-bye.